and it's been such a blessing for me to like meet so many new people that share the same things that have happened in their lives. Like hearing your story or hearing your story, it's kind of like, wow, we are so interconnected. That in turn makes me get excited to help other people and to share more and more and more about the things that I've gone through. We know that uh, as humans, we all go through this journey. And so I am curious, what what was it today that allowed you just this, or created this desire in you to participate in a conversation like this? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with both of you. Huge fan, even though I'm a Packer fan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll get into that. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I just think this is something that is just so important to talk about. And, you know, I've had my own personal struggles and people see Lauren as this cheerful, bubbly Wisconsinite, you know, that's always happy. And we, I painted this like perfect picture, you know, you have had social media, um, this superstar soccer player, but deep down inside, um, I have my own struggles just like anybody else. And I think it's just so important, um, especially now that I'm in a more mentorship role in my career, to be really transparent, really vulnerable and open, um, just to talk about the things that I've been through and how I can help others that are listening in, so. R Ricky's got such amazing uh, training and knowledge and so wisdom in so many different areas. But Ricky, one of those areas too is astrology. Yeah. And you were saying something earlier too about Lauren's sign and, and just how some of even what she shared right there probably coincides with some of that, huh? Some people use astrology to put people in boxes. I use it as a tool to help appreciate people. Mm. Um, and so a theme that I noticed often with, with people that have a lot of Leo, the, the deepest need for a Leo is, is for people to revolve around them. Mm. And I think when Typically in our culture, when we hear that, we think, oh, you're not supposed to be selfish, but we all need inspiration. Mm -hmm. We all need leaders. We all need people to, to pick us up. And I think at the core, that's what Leos are on this planet to do. But, but often, if you're the person that's here to lift up everyone for people to revolve around, like who's taking care of, who's taking care of the Leo? Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a common theme, you know, something bad happens and people don't understand, you know, this person had everything going for them. I don't get it. You know, that people that have a lot of Leo can be invisible in that sense. Yeah. Um, they shine so brightly, people can't see the human that's actually on the other side of that shine. Mm -hmm. And Man. I think for, and it's not Leos, but in general, anyone who's famous kind of has the same thing, is that people have an expectation for you to be bright and shiny all the time. And for, for us, we have to deal with like, okay, I get that, but how do we take care of ourselves in, in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think the old myth has been we hide all of those things yeah. and we pretend they're not there. But I think that's an old myth. And another theme that keeps coming up is we're all developing. Mm -hmm. We're all on a developmental journey. We're all growing, we're all learning. And I think part of the process of, of fame and learning is how do I enjoy the outside stuff and the fame, but do it at a, in a way where I still honor and take care of who I am, mm -hmm. my soul, who I am on the inside. I think it's, really amazing that you're kind of bringing the astrology piece to it because it's something I've never really tapped into or really believed in until moving out to LA and I feel like everyone talks about astrology but it's something I never really like looked into and you're you're so right you know I've always been such a giver and always help me. Everyone's like, if you need anything, call Sess. That's my nickname, Sess, you know? Like, she'll help you out. She'll, she's always be the one um, that you can call. She'll come over, take care of you. But then you're like realizing like, is anybody checking in with me? Yeah. And then it kind of hits there because like even recently, I disappeared for two weeks and I just, my friends were like, are you okay? Because it's not like me, but then they know, like I kind of go into that space um, when I when I get those little depression bouts or I'm going through a little bit of a mental health journey. And my journey with mental health is has been an interesting one because it was something I never really thought about when I was like growing up and then even in college, you know, someone talks about it, but you don't really tap into it until you get to that pro level. And then you're like, oh, wow, it is so important to make sure this, because what, we're, it's 99% of the game, right? Yeah. At least that's what I think yeah. it is all up here. And now that even 
afterwards, now that I've transitioned to what's next, I'm realizing how much more important it is. And so I'm always just so receptive into seeing what other people are doing in the mental health space. I know it works for me, but what works for me might not work for you guys. But um, the whole checking in thing is so important. It is so important. So there, yeah. There's another piece. You know, I think outside of the sports world, I think there's one idea of what mental health mm -hmm. means, but I think everything inside the sports world, because it's all about performance mm -hmm. and performing at your best, that it's it's slightly different. And so, I, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about mental health. They're dealing with something and they just want to get back yeah. over it. But for us, you know, whether it's a, a, a physical injury or something going on emotionally, it's not just about, about getting over it. It's about getting over it and then being able to go and perform at an extremely mm -hmm. high level. Um, and I, I think it's it's small inside of the sports world but i think in, it's it's a bigger concept of all of the things that we've been through to achieve what we achieved on the field all of those those skills and those lessons and those experiences they stuck with us yeah you know and i think for me the big shift came when i started applying all of those skills to my mental health mm -hmm. to being as successful on the field i mean off the field as i as i was on the field cuz for me you know, all the awards and trophies off the field, but my, I mean, on the field, but my personal life was in shambles, you know? And then one day I realized, hey, maybe if I could apply the same principles I'm using to be a good football player, to being uh, a partner, to being a father, to being a human being, to being a friend, you know, maybe I'll have more success. Mm. Yeah. There, there's that, that openness piece too. It's almost like we have to open the door to the inner journey and the mm -hmm. soul training because no one else can open it for us. Um, and I think that, you know, again, like we talked about, the myth says that, that someone in your position doesn't have problems or doesn't struggle. Um, you mentioned those two weeks, which I thought was really brave for you to say yeah. that. Um, I'm also a Leo and I can relate to those mm -hmm. moments. Is, you know, um, was there an element of for you when, when you retreat in that way whether conscious or subconscious of almost hoping that someone will notice and come. Oh, definitely. I'm always thinking that, okay, maybe someone's gonna be like, okay, well really haven't heard from her, I'm gonna check in. And then when they don't, you're kind of like, okay, am I invisible? Like, do I matter to these people? Are these the right type of people in my life? You know, and I think that's, that's a that, big thing. I've had hit, to yeah. unfortunately get rid of some people in my life that were bringing me into a low point, which is unfortunate because I never want people in my life to be bringing me into that position, but it happens, you know, because they're struggling with something. And I was always trying to be a sounding board for them, which was dragging me down. Yeah. And so I had to have a not so great talk with some people and just be like, until we can both fix ourselves, we can't be friends. And that's hard. And for, especially for someone in the role that you're typically in, like of the, the helpful yeah. uniter that you're with. Was that a skill that was new for you that you were developing of having to have those sorts of conversations and yeah, I'm not, boundaries? And <laughs> this is what I'm working on in my, in my time now is being more open with people and telling people how I feel. Like even when it comes to dating, et cetera, whatever it is, working, um, I was never one to, to do that. I would always just sugarcoat things and be like, okay, okay. But now having and really saying what's on my mind, I think, and getting a backbone, I think it's been since I've moved to LA has been a little bit more eye-opening now that I'm on my own and doing more things myself. I'm kind of like, you have to get a stronger backbone if you want to succeed the way you want to succeed. So definitely, but I'm proud of myself for, you know, being better at that. So, so the mentoring work you do, yeah. um, I'm curious, like what motivated you to move in that direction? I think the biggest thing is, so I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I didn't really have a mentor growing up. And I didn't realize how important it was until now that I've kind of stepped into that role myself, but just seeing the things that I had to go through without really having somebody. We never really had agents. We never really had anybody. I came from a small city where nobody really knew what to do with me. They're like, there's this talented kid here. I don't really know the process to get her there, where she wants to go. Luckily, I figured it out myself, thankfully, and had some um, bright shining stars along the way. Shout out to my parents. Um, <laughs> that it really helped me. They used to drive me three hours to and from practice every day just so I could, you know, play on the best team in the state. Um, 
So, so yeah, I mean, I just, for mentoring is like a huge thing for me because it's something that I wish I had. And so I just see what the things that I've gone through and now I get daily messages all the time. People are like, hey, Lauren, hey, Sess, hey, uh, can you help me with this? Can you, I just need to talk to somebody, which I appreciate because that's one thing I do love about social media. It's allowed us to be more accessible and I think sometimes athletes don't want to be accessible, but I think it's mm. really a blessing when we are accessible. And so I've I've helped a lot of people out of some hard situations, which I'm very fortunate that I was able to be able to help them. And now I'm like helping them along their journey so they can succeed and be the best version of themselves and live out their dreams. Because especially in the female sports world, it's it's a little bit difficult. So um, to be able to to be that for somebody is has been pretty awesome. The way I think about it, I feel like we li we all live in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. We live in, there's an outer world where mm -hmm. we have to deal with it, the outer stuff, the circumstances, the people, but there's also the inner world and we have to deal with that too. But that one is more private and you know, only the only parts of our inner world that show are the ones that we allow to show or when they spill over, mm -hmm. you know? And both of those are, are very frightening, frightening situations, mm -hmm. you know? When the, the vulnerability to share something sensitive about ourselves mm -hmm. that people could be could be used against us, or when we try to push it down and it builds up and finally comes over, those can be very em embarrassing embarrassing yeah. moments. And so I'm curious, like, how do you understand your developing relationship with that inner part of yourself? It's it's definitely been a learning process, but even one of my closest friends. The other day, I just started talking about something that I usually wouldn't share with somebody. And she was like, I just want you to stop right there and just, I'm appreciative that you share that with me because you hold everything inside. And so the fact that I knew that I was growing because I was like, I shared something that was like so vulnerable for me. And so for me, I know that I'm growing in that sense. I still have a long ways to go, but every day I'm getting better and better, I feel so. Yeah. Yeah, but th so this this place where we are, we just got to right now. I think this is the like the most beautiful place to be. It's scary, mm -hmm. but it's where it's where all the magic yeah. happens. Mm. And I think as athletes, it's on the field. It's easy because mm -hmm. you know after the game, the coach will point out where we could do better. You yeah. know where we can improve. And if we've gotten to this level, usually we're open to it and we're appreciative mm -hmm. of it. But I think more of the inner stuff. Right. It's yeah. hard. It's hard to be open enough to, to share it. But I've noticed with athletes, when we when we do have the courage to share it, that ability to improve and get better yeah. and develop really quickly. It, it's there in spades. Yeah. yeah. Like even in one instance, just recently, I'm very close with my parents, um, more so my father and I share everything with him, but I don't share those things with him. I didn't share when I attempted suicide with my family. Um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. But I wrote to him the other day and I said, I feel like I'm a failure. And I think that's when I went to this dark hole the last two weeks because lately I felt like a failure. Because of the, because of the suicide attempt? Or? Just, just in general, like life not panning out the way I wanted to the transition from sport to what's next. It's very difficult, especially for females. I don't have anybody to help me. Yeah. And I think I've never really said that out loud to somebody. I've thought it probably over the course of this year a lot, but I've never actually told somebody like my father that I felt like I was a failure. And I know that I'm not. I've accomplished so many incredible things. I have two medals. That's so crazy to say out loud, you know? So like, sorry, I have tissue here because <laughs> I knew that this was gonna be me. So I apologize. But, um, you know, I've accomplished everything that I set out to do in my career. Like craziness. Nobody believed in me except for my parents. And I did it. Got a scholarship, got drafted, made the national team, won a gold and bronze medal, played in the World Cup, played in the Olympics, you know? I'm freaking successful. This is bringing up a lot for me because I, I'm, I'm connecting to exactly where you are because I've been there so many times. Yeah. In, in, the, the, in my story and a lot of the people we've talked to, 
this this acknowledgement or this coming to terms with this energy of failure yeah has actually been like the the turning point yeah because there's no doubt about it, all of us we we have resumes that prove we could be successful outwardly in yeah. our sport but i think a lot at least for me what i neglected in that in that in pursuing greatness in my sport was i neglected the inner part of me yeah and and i look back at some of the things and the way i did it to get, be successful and i was like abusing yeah. something really precious inside of me and when i tapped into that feeling of failure i i was able to recognize it wasn't an external failure it was more of an internal failure of of exactly what you're doing right now of of expressing and sharing what's really in, in here yeah. you know and i think when i was playing i didn't feel like a failure i didn't i don't know why and it's not until now in this phase of my life is when i'm really like feeling that way that identity confusion yeah. that transition i'm again like you know like ricky and i i know just for you to share that here is huge, um, very sacred, very appreciated. It's hard to just move on from it. Yeah. You know, the fact that there was a moment where you felt like you didn't want to be here anymore. That's what, that was the place that you were in. Mm -hmm. um, as you look to that moment, what, what led up to it? And yeah, yeah. What, what was kind of stirring up inside of you? So, you know, I was, I had a bad injury and um, I had ACL. And I think an injury in itself, as we all know, is like is a difficult thing. But I got myself out of that. I had a great support system. I had a great daily playlist. So the injury wasn't so much the the issue for me. It was the the external voices saying like, "Oh, you're not going to be the same person." This was leading up to the World Cup. I was in the prime of my career. Had an amazing Olympics. Everyone's like, "Cecilman, one of the best defenders in the world," and you really believe that stuff when people say that about you. You're like, "Oh yes," you mm -hmm. know. I made it, and then comes the World Cup. I get back. I fall in the quarterfinals. Um, they score. We lose at home. I start getting death threats. Oh. Start getting like insane death threats. People on the streets. I'm going to I'm going to kill you. I'm going to beat you up like blah 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 and I'm people like People would see you on the streets. Oh yeah. It was cuz we were in Canada, so it made it like oh. if I feel like if we were somewhere else, it wouldn't have been as bad, but since we were on our home turf. So it just completely traumatized. Yeah. First of all, we shouldn't have been playing on turf, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um but and they watered it and everyone was slipping and falling. It's an unfortunate, you know, things happen um in the game. And um, I then that's when it switched and the media, this, I, I have to say the reporters, everybody did not help the situation. They made it way worse. And I actually got an apology from a news station because of how they handled the situation because they pretty much brought it on, I feel. How did they bring it on? Yeah. Because at the, after the game, I didn't wanna, I was like in tears. I didn't wanna talk about it. You know, I already knew like I messed up, I felt like, it was all because of me. I know it wasn't, you know. I mean, we could have scored. We, you know, we could we had opportunities to come back and we didn't, but it's just that moment and you just feel like everything that people thought about you, this amazing soccer player is gone. Like the self-worth, yeah, just like, everything just is gone. Okay, now you're the sh the crappiest player. And so that's when I went into this like you know, like the bottom of the bottom, you know, and then I was getting messages. I know you shouldn't have been on social media, but it's like, it's you're so just, hard not it's to, so hard yeah. not to be. And then it's, you're just getting messages after messages and people like just <laughs> completely crush you. And you're like, wow. And so then after that, I was kind of like, all right, you know, what's my worth? Like, am I going to continue this journey? You know, I've done everything I wanted to do. Maybe it didn't end. Maybe the way it ended was for a reason, which later on I realized it was for a reason and I helped some kids through some things. Um, situations where they, they messed up and they told me I pretty much saved their life, which was crazy. So maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Um, but I did not feel that way, <laughs> you know, in the moment until I finally came to terms with it. And then I was kind of like at the point in the journey where it's like, okay, am I done, not done? You know, we weren't making any money. I was making like 30 grand a year as a professional athlete, um, which is nothing. And um, working multiple jobs on the side while trying to be the most elite athlete you could possibly be, you know. 
it's difficult. And so I really wasn't prepared what was for what was coming next. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I went back to Green Bay, spent some time with my family. It was absolutely miserable. I kind of turned into a different version of myself that mm. I didn't even recognize. Um, I was like lashing out and I was just being like, just not a good person. And I have always been a good person. And my parents, they just don't get it because they weren't into sports. You know, my dad, yes, a little bit. He was my basketball coach and stuff, but it's just not the same when you're at that level. They just don't get it. It's like, that's your identity. That's what you, you know, you bleed every single day. Like I went out on the soccer field or the basketball court since I could walk, you know? And now you're like, I hate it. Um, every association. Yeah. And that's trauma, right? Yeah. Like extreme trauma mm -hmm. coming at you from so many angles. Yeah. And again, like I think that's one of the things that's I'm so appreciative of your story to use as an example for people who are watching or listening in that sense of, you know, that wasn't you being a different version of yourself. That was just you being traumatized. Yeah. And dealing with all that comes with that experience mm -hmm. of that trapped emotion that you couldn't yeah. release. And, um, and so it, it ended up just continuing to get worse, it sounds like. Yeah, and they don't really set you up with anything, right? Retirement, nothing, or like kind of get you help or like have somebody to talk to about those experiences. They're kind of like, okay, good luck. Whatever happens to you happens to you. And you're kind of like, cool, like I gave you so much of me and just I still wouldn't change it for the world. I have to say that yeah. I, I had the best time of my life, but in that moment, I wish that women's soccer and just sports in general had more support. I know I have a lot of friends in the NFL and the support that they wish they had, et cetera. And then um, it was one night, my parents went to sleep. I took their car and um, I sat in front of a tree. I just wanted to hit the gas. I have never felt like that in my entire life. And I almost did it. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be there anymore. I feel like I'm an ugly crier, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I had like a little wake up call. I sat there and I said, what are you doing? Where'd that come from, you think? I've, I'm a lot stronger than I thought I was. Mm. And I thought of all the amazing people in my life that I'd be letting down. And I sat there for an hour, I think it was. Just sitting there in that car. In the car, and it's freezing cold in Wisconsin, we all know. <laughs> it's like a thunder, I mean, it was like a snowstorm at the time. So, um, so I turned it around, and I went home and I went to sleep and got up like nothing happened. Like nothing happened. My parents had no idea. I don't even know if they do still to this day. I think my dad mentioned something once, but we never talked about it. So for me, like what I'm picking up is like the, the travesty of, of hiding, yeah. of not expressing these things. And it's something that's passed down to all of us because my experience is when I had that same moment that you just described, yeah. that's when, from that point on is when I actually started to live. And that's how I felt. Wow, like a rebirth. Kind of, and I was like, you can turn this around into a positive. I did get looked at and realized that I had severe concussions, which I think was part of the trauma. Yeah, um, on top of what you had just gone through. Though, yeah, which so is I think that traumatic. a lot of it was attributed to that is what the doctor told me and how I was feeling that way and how I would just start randomly crying in the car and I just wasn't myself. So I figured out I had to make a change. I needed to get out of my parents' house. I needed to figure out what was I gonna do. So then I came to LA and I've kind of just been here since trying to figure it out. Well, we've been talking about this and I, I feel like when professional athletes, you know, in, in certain ways, you know, we've found ways to master the body. Yeah. But I think it retards the, the maturation process in a lot of ways mm -hmm. because all the energy that would be going into certain kinds of development are gone into physical, physical yeah. development. But I, I always think of that movie, uh, Billy Madison. Yeah. You know, when okay. he goes back to school and he does every grade in two weeks. Mm -hmm. I think we have to go back. But if we do the work of going back, we move through the grades really yeah. quickly. Uh -huh. And I think we pass everyone else because of that root training. But the, the obstacle is the myth. 
is that we don't allow ourselves to acknowledge where we're still children, yep. where we still have to develop. And, and the, the themes of death and rebirth, right? Even the thought process, if I don't want to be here, I want to end this, okay? Right? That's a perfectly valid uh, way to die mm -hmm. because we're realizing an old idea, an old part of ourself, okay, has to die so that a new part of us can be born. Totally. And, I, and I think of that as the maturation process. Because again, that moment I was right there. It was the yeah. only time in my life I ever contemplated suicide. Yeah. And it was very, very similar circumstances. And what I realized is that version of me that I created when I was seven, mm -hmm. that version of me when I didn't know shit. Yep. I said a bad word. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know anything about the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I was still trying to make that version of what I wanted to be real. And in order for a more adult version of me to come, that little kid version of yeah. me had to die. Painful, extremely painful. But I almost, at least for me, almost like the moment after, I felt this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I agree with that. How, how did your dad respond? He was like, you really felt this way? You, he's like, I had no, like, he just had no idea. I'm Because he looks at me, I'm the, the oldest, I'm the only girl. And so he's kind of like, oh, he's just daddy's little girl. And he's just like, how did you not feel like you could talk to me about this and how you were feeling and I'm very close to my mom too but my dad and I just had this crazy bond and and then I felt really bad that I didn't really have those and then lately we've been having a lot more deeper conversations which has been extremely healthy for both of us. I, Ricky you said this earlier too because it's you know it's, it, we're bumping up into the can'ts yeah right mm. in the can'ts that we internalize I can't say this I can't dare share this with that person right isn't it just it's fascinating that we internalize can'ts even, and in situations like this, it's like, what do you think it was that drove the can't with, with your dad? Here's this guy that you're able to feel this incredible closeness to, but it's almost yeah. like, I can't. I just didn't want him to look at me differently. Ugh. I think that was the biggest thing. Like, and then he, and then in turn him feeling like he failed in some aspect, mm. I think, because he's my whole heart. You sharing this, I think like one of the things that I think is so powerful, one of the greatest misconceptions we have about suicide is that um, we can't talk about it because it'll encourage it in reality. The more we talk about it, the more we prevent it. And so by telling these stories yeah. in really vulnerable ways, so thank you for your courage. Thank you. And, and just, and also too, this aftermath of like, you not only did you have that moment, but you were courageous enough to share that with your father and would you take that back? Do you feel like it's 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 progressing in a direction that feels right given 100%. the risk? 100% with him and then just in general, just talking about this with the kids that I coach or just being open on social media. Even people who aren't athletes reach out to me on the daily. Like if I share something intimate and they're like, you feel this way too? Like I had no idea you felt this way. And like, you're a, like, you're a person, you're real, you know? Like I, so I'll just have the most random conversations with people I don't even know. And they're like, I just need someone to talk to. I'm like, hey, like, hi, I'm here. Maybe I needed to talk to you today as well, mm -hmm. too. So they think that we have everything. But in reality, you know, we're all searching for something. I like to say, and it's, it's not 100% true, but I think it's uh, the, the inner part of us has been so ignored. Yeah. You know, I, I realized like I have a, a one and a half year old. And like people talk about the inner child and we allow, we allow the child to exist usually until they get to be around two, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have to like grow up, start to grow up. But I think that, that, that inner part of it, that inner child, as people call it, is always there, you know, and if we don't tend to it, it doesn't grow. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the key phrase now is emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. The part of us that gains emotional intelligence is that inner, is that inner child. Yeah. And I, I think for, for famous people, for people that are in the spotlight to, to honor that part of themselves, it's like you said, it becomes an example and it breaks, it disrupts the myth. Mm -hmm. Because what we're realizing is true happiness. Mm -hmm. It only comes when you face those, those, yep. those parts of yourself and you have the courage to, to express them. Mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like the, what the soul really wants is expression. Yep. You know, and we, but from the time we're little, right, the soul becomes somewhat annoying to the adults. Mm -hmm. And so we're taught to suppress it and then act like an adult 
by being performative, by having, by having, by producing something that makes us feel worthy. Uh, and I would wonder for you and your experience, you named a, f a few things off the top too, like, and I thought of them as all, all, uh, all barriers to exactly what you're talking about, right? Like uh, cultures that may train within soccer, cultures mm -hmm. that may train within womanhood, you know, um, you know, even being an attractive woman, I think creates even more barriers uh, and containers of like, it creates more can'ts. So as you look through those can'ts that, that kind of got created, um, I wonder if that does create more pressure on you, feeling like you're in all these environments where the prevailing message is, no, you're not allowed to. Yeah. Mixed I, with the bubbly personality and the helper and all those oh, things. Oh, I, I mean, I think so. Because, I mean, especially now that I've shifted into, like, entertainment and all that stuff, it's kind of like, especially, too, that I'm older as well. I think that's another thing, too, because... <laughs> You're like, oh, they're gonna get a younger person to do this, 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 this. You just have so many thoughts running through your head. And like, lately I've been finding myself be like, oh, I'm looking real old now. I'm like, look, look, oh, like, you know, just like little things through your, through your mind on the daily that it's like you can't talk about that or you can't be this or you can't do that because someone's gonna perceive you in a different way. So um, I think there is a lot of pressure, especially as a female. Um, and, yet, so, and yet you're here now, and yet uh, I'm here protesting it or, yes. <laughs> you know, like, I love that. You know, I love that. I'm curious how it even feels now. Like you've shared so much here, you know, I have to space. say, like, I think it's so important. Then you see like the people who have already come out and talked about certain things and have stood up for all the other females going through things like, like Alex Morgan. I, you know, love her to death and all the stuff that she's helped with with all the stuff that was going on in our league and being the voices and so I want to be one of those powerful voices as well and um, and just I love the bond that we have in the athletic community whether we be male or female I think I see it all coming together and people really opening up and listen to like male athletes being like what was your experience like in this this and this because they didn't have any ideas and connecting with so, so many different people has been such a blessing for me. And then like hearing your story or hearing your story, it's kind of like, wow, we are so interconnected. And it's been, I've been forming so many new bonds and it's been such a blessing for me to like meet so many new people that share the same things that have happened in their lives. And so that in turn makes me get excited to help other people and to share more and more and more about the things that I've gone through. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a beautiful thing to see, like all the stuff that you do is is so amazing, you know? And you. just just seeing how many lives you've changed and helped and you as well, everybody is, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. One of the things we've talked about a lot is uh, you know, when you're on the stage and an athlete, people see us as just the, the hero or the heroine yeah. and they don't see like what else is going mm -hmm. on. Um, and we can get stuck into how we're perceived. Mm -hmm. But for me, the freedom of being away from the sport is that there was more space yeah. to be myself. And so how would you like to be? Ideally, I don't know if I'm in that same headspace quite yet. How would but, you put, but you can still yeah. answer the question of how yeah. you would like to be perceived. I think kind of the same way that people do already look at me as this bubbly um, individual that's that's down for whatever, that loves to eat, loves to dance, loves to have a good time, um, is always going to be a shoulder to cry on or, or an ear to, to listen. Um, because I think that's the one part of me that I love so much that I'm I am that way. And so I want people to to continue to see that, but also to see how much I've grown as a person and all the things that I've been through. And by sharing this, they can see like all the things that I'm, you know, doing now and into the future that I've also grown as a person as well. And um, yeah, I think that's just like the biggest thing for me is just to, to show that I'm evolving just as you're evolving and we're all in this together, I think is so important. Yeah. I was saying that's like those words are part of words that I use in a forgiveness meditation uh -huh. because that to me the key to forgiveness is re remembering that we're all evolving. Yep. You know, and we're doing it together. And mm -hmm. the more we can understand that and take care of each other in yep. the process, ah, it's so much 
more yeah. fun. And yeah. that's what I loved about a team sport because mm -hmm. for a team to keep getting better and to be successful, the team has to evolve together. And that comes from the mistakes we make and then correcting mm -hmm. the mistakes and, and to, keep on, to keep on moving forward. Yeah. That can be a tremendous loss too, right? Like going from a team sport, you know, part of it is the career transition and the yeah. identity. I'm no longer a footballer or a soccer player and you know, who am I now and all those things, that, that crisis, but also the community crisis. Yeah. What was that like for you playing on such a- I think that's one of the biggest challenges because um, for me, like that was my sisterhood. That was, I was around like-minded women like me my whole life, you know, that have wanted to reach the, you know, that top pinnacle. And it's like, and now that that community is, not that it's gone, but it's just not as present as it used to be, was a big transition. I'm, you know, I'm the type of person that's very okay being alone, which is kind of a bad thing, but I, I can hang out with myself a lot, you know, read a book, do whatever and be okay. But I'm also realizing that that's not what I should be doing. <laughs> so I just went on a girl's trip and they were like, it's good to see you, Lauren, it has been a while. So not having that community has been difficult, but I've been working hard at finding a new community in here. And I've found my little soccer, you know, little soccer crew out here that um, I love so much. And so it's just, as I said, what I said before, is just making sure you're surrounding yourself with people who believe in you, that you can trust, um, that uplift you instead of bringing you down, I think is, is so crucial. I have a very, it's a very small knit group of people, but that's all I need. Yeah. So the, mm -hmm. what you just said is I think true for everyone, but mm -hmm. I found it to be especially true for, for Leos. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite phrases when I'm talking to a Leo is go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. Yep. Because Dang. so much of the, the king or the one. queen, right, is you need, right, you need your subjects. Yeah. Right. But if, and this is, comes back to what you're saying, like how you're perceived. Mm -hmm. If your subjects don't have the ability to perceive you in a way that feels good to you, right? Maybe they're the wrong subjects, mm -hmm. right? And that the ideal community, the ideal group will, will cherish you, they'll mm -hmm. lift you up, right? They'll, they'll appreciate. That's one of my favorite new words is appreciate. Yeah, love I love that, that word. But in order to appreciate something, there has to be an education first, mm -hmm. right? It, music. Okay, I start listening to a new type of music. And I'm like, I don't get it. A good mm -hmm. friend of mine who loves this music starts to break it down. Oh, now I can. Oh, okay. Yeah. I might not like the music, but I've learned to appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. And I think part of uh, helping people learn to appreciate me is I had to share. I had to educate mm -hmm. them on who I really was. I think the appreciation that people are going to continue to have for you is going to be great as you continue to share your story. Thank you. And I do have to say too, it's it's really refreshing to see men share that. Like when I first saw Kevin Love talk, is when I actually really started opening up. So I have wow. to be. It's pretty. It's pretty cool to see men tapping into their emotional side. I, I was going to say something similar of not only men, but it's it's men and a woman having this kind of conversation, yes. which is so, I think just people watching this, the, the healing is gonna come just from this dynamic mm -hmm. and people seeing that it can be safe to go there with, with other people. And so I, I definitely wanna say thank you for your, for your courage and, and your willingness to, like, to go there with us. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you both so much. It's, this has been kind of like a little therapy session for me that I needed, you know? Now I feel like very uplifted and, excited. And I think that's, you know, for me too, even as someone that formally calls myself a therapist or trained therapist, like that's my hope. I mean, my, my hope is that our, our profession will loosen the grip on this, this perceived territory that we have on mm -hmm. healing and transformation and say, no, the reality is if we promote this in culture, we won't need specialized listeners. We won't need specialized care. Like we can get it back in community and I do think it's from having more conversations yeah. just like this, of vulnerability, compassion, love, acceptance, all mm -hmm. those things. Yeah, there's, there's, two, there's two things here that just come up. Like one, vulnerability, but it's, it's sensitivity needs to protect itself. Mm -hmm. And so if we're vulnerable in front of people that don't have the ability, yes. the ability to respond, you know, then, then it's, it can be dangerous. And so part of it is, is recognizing when people have the ability to respond to our vulnerability because part of the vulnerability that's the that's the first action but the the most important 
is the response. Yep. You know, and, I, and I'm talking to someone and I say the, these moments, these healing moments, something comes out of us and we're shaking as it comes out mm -hmm. because we're not sure. Or sometimes we feel so comfortable and it accidentally comes out. Right, and as it comes out, we're waiting for the response mm -hmm. to come back. That wait is the longest is wait the longest in the whole way. damn world, yes. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And when we get a different response than we expected, oh. yeah. that's where You're the like, healing occurs. Yeah. Hmm. That's where the healing occurs? That's where the, because <laughs> usually when it comes out that way, the response we're expecting is that we're gonna get some negative response. You know, right. someone telling their deepest, darkest secret, again, it slips out, Yeah. right? Or I'm shaking as it comes out and I'm expecting judgment, right, or a feeling, and that doesn't come back, there's space where I realize, oh, more of this can come out. Oh. The cool thing is, is that we have a young uh, audience. They're so comfortable with this idea of mental health. They're so comfortable with the inner journey, right? But they, they don't always see what comes next. Yeah. That vulnerable moment, the, what it looks like to actually acknowledge the pain write the letter to your father, share it with the world. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the cool thing is, is the realization that those young people are gonna be looking at someone like yourself and saying, that's, or that's my true inspiration. And that in doing that, you haven't just inspired them to go play a sport, you've inspired them to live a vulnerable life. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's beautiful. And I'm so, we're so appreciative of this conversation with you today. Thank you for, letting me be vulnerable and open. I don't cry often in front of people, so. Hey. <laughs> it feels good to kind of release it and, and you know, listen to what you guys have to say and, 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 and know that you've gone through similar things and um, this has been great for me.